biology and anthropology and genetics is really founded in a racist ideology. My name's Adam Rutherford. I'm a geneticist, author, and broadcaster. I will inevitably get loads of racism and be called a racist yeah. because I'm talking about racism. Yeah. I'm Faiza Shaheen. I'm an economist, one-time political candidate, and activist. Unfortunately, COVID could just be a dress rehearsal for something much worse. Mm. When you look at climate and potentially other pandemics and, and things that can go wrong. Science is political and always has been political. And if you say it's not, you haven't been paying attention for the last 500 years. So Adam, I've been dying to ask you, you've written this book called How to Argue with a Racist. How do you argue with a racist? <laughs> yeah. I, I sometimes worry that that title is a little bit pugnacious for what the book actually sets out to do. Um, the, the point is, if you structure your, your arguments with, with facts and with science and with history, then these are tools which are, are very clearly anti-racist in their, in their nature, right? That they're, they're not apolitical and, and science isn't amoral and it does inherently have a political stance because it's done by people. And so, you know, I sometimes think that the, the conversation gets distracted by talking about white supremacists or active neo-Nazis, and, you know, there's plenty of them around, but in fact, I'm more sort of concerned with talking to people who say, who, who effectively have racist views or say things which are effectively racist without really knowing it, mm -hmm. because it's built in, race and racism is built into our society. When I was writing it, a lot of younger people were saying, to me, um, you know, I wish I had this when I'm in the pub, or when I'm sitting around the dinner table or the Thanksgiving table and talking to my dad or my uncle or, or uh, it, someone who says something which is like, you know, well, aren't black people better at sprinting? Hmm. Or, well, you know, aren't Jewish people more intelligent? And that's what I wanted to do is to say, well, A, are these stereotypes correct? What is the data? where you're getting that information from? And B, how does those, those stereotypes relate to how we understand history and how we understand you know, historical persecutions or historical racisms? And in almost all cases, what turns out to be the case is, one, the data is probably not true, and two, they're stereotypes that are rooted in, in history. And, and as soon as you know that, you know, you've got a better argument. Hmm. I'm gonna disagree with you to some extent because whilst I find your book super helpful. When I was campaigning and knocking on thousands of doors, actually facts don't seem to work that well when you have conversations with people. Mm. And because people always seem to find another fact or they'll, you know, they just won't necessarily believe you. What did work was emotions and emotional connection and then bringing in some facts. I went gung-ho, like, you know, I've been doing stats for many years, you know, whether it be some of the stuff I did for BBC, looking into whether we'd have a black prime minister and finding that, you know, black kids will have to work 12 times as hard than a white state educated and 90 times as hard as a white privately educated to become prime minister, you know. But for the most part, people didn't really take that in. What they did take in was stories of, you know, my great grandmother being part of the British working class or, Oh yeah, I went to that school too and having a connection with a teacher mm -hmm. um, and then building that foundation of connection and then trying to bring in like maybe some more scientific arguments. Um, so did you learn that on the job? I mean, when, yeah. you're, when you're going door to door, yeah. what was it like? It was really fun, I have to say. I really enjoyed door knocking. I mean, people might find that crazy. People actually do want to have political conversations. Um, and when they don't, they make it really clear. So, um, you know, you can back off quite quickly. The thing that I found is that it's very rare that someone's racist to your face. I mean, it did happen, but it was very rare. And people just want to know that they're speaking kind of human to human and they, they want to know a little bit about you and um, they're willing to have a conversation. Um, and that really surprised me. One of the things that really struck me from like Twitter world versus knocking on people's doors was how much more hopeful I was after a two hour session of like knocking on people's doors and talking to them rather than looking at my replies on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, people really surprised me and people would say that they 
change their minds about certain things, but not through facts, unfortunately. And I've just spent my whole life like yeah. learning how to put pull stats together. It was often because I had a really nice conversation with you today. And, you know, sometimes just having that conversation was enough and you didn't have to bring in this, the stats and the science. But it's very hard to change people's minds. So saying that it's very, very hard. Yeah, sure. And sometimes I felt like people would just be like, say, OK, OK, just because they wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> well, yeah, well, OK, so that was what I was going to ask. So how quickly when you open the door? Because I didn't do that, right? I don't, I don't go door to door and ask you people. You should go and like, see like, how you're... How to, <laughs> I think I would, how to argue with the racist yeah, works. <laughs> I think I'd just be so depressed so quickly. Um, I mean, how quickly were people judging you? They look you up and down and go, here is someone who looks like you. I don't know anything else about you. And therefore, you fit into the following stereotypes that I'm going to adhere to. I had to demonstrate that I belonged to the area. I had to go over, like, beyond because people just would assume, someone was like, are you from Newham? Which for people that don't know, is it part of East London where there's more people that look like me? And I'd be like, why would you assume that? But when did it become this point of like, I belong and you don't? Well, I, I, again, I think that this is a lot to do with our sort of cultural amnesia mm. uh, and very selective telling of the history of empire that actually black and brown people have been present in this country, well, since Roman times, admittedly in smaller proportions, but that, 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 that once you understand that phrase that we are here because you were there and that empire is the reason that we live in a multicultural society, that if we teach that, if we have a much richer understanding of the relationship between the various colonised places that occurred during, um, during the, the years of empire, that maybe there would be a better, a, a better sense of belonging, that, there would, mm. that, that, that it, it stops being so... I mean, have you ever questioned your belonging? I grew up in a, a small town in, in the east coast of England, I, that, that was when I first experienced racism. But, you know, bear in mind, I look like this, right? So my dad is, is, is from Yorkshire um, and my, my biological mother is Indian via Guyana, mm -hmm. right? So that's my mixed raceness. I did experience some racism in that, in that uh, village when I was growing up, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's minor stuff. And also... So your parents didn't say to you what I always got and which most people of colour that I know got, which is like, you're going to have to work twice as hard to get anywhere. You didn't get that? I didn't get that because all of my experiences of racism were effectively positive. Uh, and, and maybe that is a reflection of my own privilege and, and being mixed race rather than, um, uh, you know, integrated into one particular ethnicity. Um, Did your parent, because with me, I mean, it was such an important part, like my dad taught us about racism. He, had, in fact, used to tell us that if anyone calls you the P word... Yeah. Um, he used to make us practice punching on him. This is hilarious. We're not, I'm not a violent person. So he used to line the three of us up and say, right, punch me here as hard as you can. If anyone ever says it to you, you punch them in the face. I was six years old, right? <laughs> and, um, this is, and then my mom at the same time, who was the polar opposite to my, to my dad and was actually from Pakistan, and she would say, no, if they say that to you, tell them that um, the P word means clean in Urdu. And so, like, one time, Barry at primary school in the playground said to me the P word. And I said, and I thought about it, should I punch him or should I use mum's line? And I decided not to punch him and say, and I said, the P word means clean. And he was so confused. <laughs> and then it meant that he just didn't, it just was actually, like, perfect because he just never said anything again about it because he just looked so confused. So, so my version of that story, it, it, the parallels are very striking there because, <laughs> because um, when I got called... The, the P word at school when I was about seven um, by a kid whose name I still remember, but I won't say it. And, and I did punch him. <laughs> and I do not advocate violence. Um, but I got summoned by the headmaster um, and I was terrified um, because I thought I was going to get into big trouble. Yeah. And what happened was he suspended him. Right, and so the outcome, for, okay. and this is what I mean by being positive experiences. So. That's really good because my teacher used to say, just ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so, th so that, that's why I think that my own personal experience and my own personal narrative is, is not necessarily very informative for, my own, for the development of my ideas. Mm. It's not absent. It sets you on a path to trying to understand what was going on in that situation. But I can't pretend that I've been the recipient of serious racial abuse through my life. Mm. More so for you? I mean, I think, I mean... Yeah, I mean, you get trolled now if you're a public person. Sure. So, you know, it's... A, and there's certainly been instances through life. But for me, 
you know, it's more about the subtle ways that these things come up. You know, being in the room when, you know, your colleagues are talking about migrant labour and they say, well, migrant labour has become uh, in, from the Caribbean and, and Pakistan has become obsolete. And you're in the room and they've obviously forgotten that you're there. Mm -hmm. So it's these, and, and actually I experienced a lot more racism when I went to the University of Oxford and um, in like middle class world, yep. the think tank world. And this is, you know, today the stereotype about the white working class is also really negative because they're pathologized into like this racist group. But my experience of growing up with a white working class, of course there's racism everywhere, but I, I got much worse racism and like, when I was at the University of Oxford, which really scared me because I was like, these people are going to be in positions of power. They are going to run the world. And I know what they really think because I've seen them get drunk. Yep. <laughs> like, and so that actually was really important in me deciding to, you know, do, do policy work, push myself to be more public in my work. Because I thought, I know what those people really think of us. And what they think of working class people, especially. So I'd just done a big TV programme on the BBC and I was used as an example of the BBC's successful uh, racial diversity. Right. And when I heard that, I was like, if I am your racial diversity, then you have a real problem. Yeah, and it's really important that you point that out because they will use you. Yeah. They will use us at times and it's really important that we say, this isn't real change. Real change is when I see, you know, ethnic minorities in this country and marginalised groups all around the world, you know, being given real opportunities, not on, not disproportionately on lower wages, not disproportionately dying from whatever yeah. virus or illness is coming up, um, you know, having equal access to public services. That's the real change that I want to see. It's not, you know, just the odd, as they say, black faces in high places, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. It's not and enough. No, it's no, exactly. Enough. And, you know, we see, we see good representation of black and brown faces on TV, but we don't see it behind the camera. And we see amazing representation of black faces in, you know, football, for example, but we don't see any of it in the managerial it's structure. really noticeable, right? Really Who noticeable. Who gets to have power? Who gets to write the script? Who gets to coach the team? Who gets to be the judge, right? So yeah, that type of representation, real representation and real power. Yeah, it's still me, missing. Yeah. And that, and even the conversation about racism still today is too superficial for me. Like, I want to go much deeper and think much more about institutional change. Okay, should we have some audience questions yes. now? Hi, hi from Toronto, Canada. Um, as you've said, racism is politically advantageous in a white supremacist world. It wins elections. It's one of the engines that keeps capitalism running. It justifies the subjugation of racialized people to low wage labor and poverty. So why are we still trying to argue with racists about the scientific basis of our shared humanity when it wouldn't serve them to recognize it? Yeah, well, that's a great question. But I think that the answer from my point of view is, and, and part of the motivation for writing this book, is that the, I, I found that the, the, the science in this book is not new and not controversial. So the idea that the biological essentialism and, the, and a biological basis for race has been utterly taken down by science, by genetics, that is a non-controversial thing to say within the lab, within academia. But what I found as a science communicator and talking to publics is that that, that information hasn't filtered down into, into public consciousness. And, and that's on me, right? You know, I'm, I, that's my job is to do that. Um, and then secondly, on top of that, that in the last few years, with the rise of populism and nationalism and changing political discourse, but also the way the public has embraced particular genetic ancestry testing uh, kits, products, I think has actually changed the conversation about race and reintroduced biological essentialism ideas into the public discourse in a way that I don't think any of us within genetics anticipated. So I think part of my job is actually just, again, disabusing people of those of those ideas in a way that I didn't think we'd have to do if we were having this conversation 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I want to acknowledge how hard it is to do this work, especially if you're a person of colour, and to have these conversations with racists. It's exhausting and there's just times when you just think what's the point of having this conversation they're just not gonna they're not gonna see it but I think more generally what we have to do 
is counter the way in which um, racism is being used to support certain governments and certain ideologies, right wing, you know, quite mainstream ideologies. And we've got to keep having that conversation. And one of the areas that I find that I get most hope is when I have this conversation with the younger generation who are not everyone, but for the most part, it seems much more up for talking about this. We need to all do the work and have the conversations. Um, and it doesn't just start with government. It just starts with you in your own household and within your own family and at your school. And, you know, we need people to do the work that isn't just people of colour. Let's have another question. So you've touched base a little bit on uh, how COVID affects inequality. Um, how do you think it could have been different with COVID if it wasn't for the polarization we had towards the virus? Thank you. COVID really has exposed the levels of inequality in societies, whether it be about gender-based inequalities, whether it be about race, whether it be about income and who's losing their job, um, who is most likely to die. Um, and it's really put society under an X-ray and, and demonstrated how much inequality matters. And that is a lesson for us going forward because unfortunately COVID could just be a dress rehearsal for something much worse. Mm. We look at climate and potentially other pandemics and, and things that can go wrong. And I think cohesive societies that can look after each other are important, that can stick together, that follow instructions, that's going to be really important for any kind of crisis coming up. Yeah. From my perspective, it exposed how we think about science and society as well and the relationship between science and policy. Um, and so, you know, the fact that it was racialized in two discrete ways early on. One was the provenance of the disease. So there was, you know, racialized attacks. Right here in London, a kid from my own university from Singapore was beaten on Oxford Street. In America, there are so many attacks against Chinese Americans and Korean Americans uh, that it has its own Wikipedia page, you know, in numbers in the many thousands already. So that was that was one aspect to it. And then we, how um, minority groups are more likely to be infected and more likely to die, and these are best explained by socioeconomic factors rather than rather than sort of you know genetics or molecular biology. You can't deal with a with a pandemic without having science, and you can't make vaccines yeah. without science. Yeah. That you know that that is our job in in this process. But if you don't deal with the underlying problems, and, and in fact, the underlying causes of this pandemic, which is man's, humankind's interaction with nature mm -hmm. itself, the fact that we're encroaching upon territories because of climate change and causing climate change, which means that we are interacting in nature where these viruses, where coronaviruses live. Humankind is not exonerated from this conversation. It's not a natural phenomenon that this that this occurred, that this pandemic occurred. It's because of our integrated mm -hmm. relationship and changing relationship with the environment. I think we're going to take another question. Hi. Um, something that you've both brought up is education and anti-racism in the education system. I think at large, um, it's still not widely taught in schools and university, or when it is taught, it's quite exclusive to slavery um, or history rather than an intersectional subject across all um, all subjects. So, in your respective fields, so economics and science, how what do you think needs to take place in order for for us to be learning about racism and understanding anti-racism in the education system? So, I think we're at an interesting nexus right now because the concept of anti-racism has been weaponized against anti-racists. <laughs> Um, which is, you know, fundamentally problematic. You know, our government are focusing very much on this question of whether the introduction of, of discussions about anti-racism, you know, are serving education. Uh, I, I teach at UCL, just over there, and um, we have race and genetics and race and eugenics integrated into our bio biology courses, and that's been like that for 40 years. I think that might be a slightly unusual history because a lot of race science and eugenics actually occurred at UCL. And what I've discovered in the last couple of years since doing this book is that that conversation doesn't even spill outside of the biology department at UCL, let alone into the broader society. I think that overall, my sense is that to normalize these conversations is part of the social 
change. It requires a political movement and it requires, you know, revolutionary voices and conservative voices. But ultimately, you know, I do think that the arc of, of history is towards progress. I think that is true. I think we're in a weird blip at the moment. I don't know. What, I mean, do you, do, you, do you agree or disagree with that? I hope it's a blip, but I also worry that we are, you know, regressing. I think we are at a very worrying time. Like if we're not going to learn the lessons from COVID, um, if we're not able to say, OK, yes, we truly are going to build back better. We're going to make sure we do do a Green New Deal and we do have higher wages and, um, you know, invest more in our healthcare systems and the rest of it. Um, then we would have missed this this major moment in which we could have had that acceleration of change, positive change, like there was after the Second World War. And just just to answer your question as well, on just what the economics discipline can do. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with the way in which economics is taught. But one thing I would say to those studying economics right now is to ask the distributional questions. Ask who will this policy or will this particular way of um, looking at markets, who will be affected, who will win and who will lose? And ask why. And when you ask those questions and you follow that through of why, you always come back to issues of prejudice. And it's really important for us to push back on subjects like, you know, I hear, I'm hearing from you on science and genetics um, and, um, you know, economics, which also kind of thinks of itself as a science sometimes, even though it's a social science. I think it's fairly obvious to the audience. We both like poking the nest um, and, you know, asking people to be challenged or deliberately challenge them. I didn't get into this to talk about race. I got into this because I really like evolution and DNA and genes. But the point, but there comes a point where, you know, if you're a scientist talking about humans, then you can't not talk about this. Mm. And I think that, you know, that's my message to, to my, my scientific um, colleagues and friends, is that it's not enough to sit back and say, you know what, we did the research and it's up to people and publics and governments to talk about the policy implications necessary or otherwise for my work. We are part of society, and I think it's the same for economists as well, that, that, that we need a much better, more integrated approach to understanding our history and how our history informs our present. Science is political and always has been political, and if you say it's not, you haven't been paying attention for the last 500 years. Yeah, Adam, it's been really good to speak to you. And even though I looked at your book and I know that there's this history in science of, of racism and the way in which science is often used by, by racists, um, I think it's one of the things that I'll really take from this conversation is really both as us as individuals trying to do our work and finding that in our disciplines and economics, um, in science, there's this massive blind spot when it comes to race and racism and prejudice and the way in which it's playing out in our industries or sectors. I think that's something that everyone can look at their own sphere of work and understand that racism and prejudice is always there. We all have it within us, right? We're socialised to be racist all the time. We have to take action to fight it. And it's both at the individual level and within our disciplines. Um, if we're willing to be have that conversation and be brave, um, then we will be somewhere else in, in five years or in 10 years. Um, and that is the work that needs to be done. So it, even though it's difficult, I do find it difficult. Um, it's a positive sign ultimately, because you know it wouldn't be worth changing if it wasn't hard work like this. You know, Absolutely. And it is called a struggle for, the, for a reason. So, yeah. so keep going. Yes, keep going. I'm going to do the Turkish thing because we can't like shake oh, yeah. hands or hug or anything. So yeah. I'm going to do the Turkish like. Well, I'm going to copy you. Thank like... you. I couldn't accept the reality. Am I actually going to go on a rubber boat and cross the Aegean with 60 people to seek asylum in Europe? When I was a teenager listening to Eminem, I never expected that this would happen. It's very, very important for me that you acknowledge the honor that is due to my food. I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care your ethnicity. Please cook my food, but at least respect my roots. To come here navigating bureaucracy, racism, 
language barriers, taboos and stigmas, and then rebuild your life is by itself a success.